Hello all, this is Dr. Misha Kwasniewski from Penn State. This is the fourth and final CIDR class lecture. Today we're going to be covering a lot, uh, basically trying to go over some of the things that you can set yourself up for success in CIDR making, as well as some of the things that can go wrong. You should have by this point gotten the, the realistic impression that in just four one hour classes, you probably aren't going to learn everything that there is to grow cider apples and make cider. But hopefully this will wrap up giving you a good idea of some of the things that you may want to investigate a little bit more. Or if you start to have troubles, you at least have some indication where they may have been coming from. One of the first things that you can do to ensure success is starting out with a strong fermentation. And while excellent ciders can be made through wild or natural ferments, I would say for the beginning cider maker, you want to do everything as conservatively as possible. And by this, I mean having clean fruit that you do a sizable dosage of SO2, which you can find charts for what is appropriate for a sulfur dioxide addition at a given pH. And then you want to, after 12 to 24 hours after that dosage, when the SO2 is reacted and sort of knocked out all of the yeast, actually inoculate with a known strain and having a strong known cider strain that's going to produce good flavors and also outcompete any other microbes is one of the best ways of ensuring that at least at the end of fermentation you've got a product that you're going to be happy with. I'm not going to cover much into specific yeast strains because there are just, I mean, truly hundreds. And there's ones that are used for wine making and beer making and cider specific isolates, some of which are good at high alcohol content, some of which are very fast fermenters, some of which are slower fermenters probably the most used again for ensuring success is some sort of champagne yeast strain and the reason why champagne yeast tend to be so effective is that they're yeast that can start fermenting again even after there's high alcohol so in champagne production you actually do for two fermentations and we're going to talk about this a little bit at the end of this one, the primary to create alcohol, the second, a secondary to create CO2. And so these yeasts are really good at outcompeting lots of other things as well as even if things aren't going really well, um, either from nutrition or maybe the temperature isn't great, they're probably still going to win. Um, if you are delving into wild or natural fermentations, you can even start out by that there's some complex mixtures that you can buy from some of these companies that you can sort of do a wild fermentation light, if you will. Um, if, however, you start to go towards just truly using your natural yeast, there are ways of manipulating and trying to ensure that you get a better versus you know an unexpected product one of which is actually just sort of fostering your own natural yeast strain and you do this by first doing a small ferment growing it up having a lot of yeast lees at the end of that and if you're happy with the product then you could upscale that to you know thousands of gallons Rehydration can be one of the most critical control points of ensuring a quality product as well as a predictable fermentation. And there are a number of different products that can be used, but I'm going to mention one trade name that shows up a lot. GoFirm is a rehydration nutrient. 
And so this is going to be dissolved in your water before you even start to dissolve your yeast. And this helps to make sure that there isn't excess osmotic stress. And so osmotic stress um, is happening because if you just had water, lots of that water is going to want to flow in way too much into the yeast. And then you'll actually get them exploding inside there and it'll just look like carnage if you looked under a microscope. But adding this pre-nutrient helps alleviate there being osmotic stress but also give the yeast some basic nutrients as they're starting the fermentation. This is done at about 40 degrees C. So if you don't have a th thermometer, this is like at the extreme where it feels warm, but not hot. So you're looking for something that it's nice, warm, like sort of think Warm to hot bath water is what you're going for. If it feels uncomfortable, it's too hot for yeast too. And then you rehydrate the yeast after you've dissolved the pre-fermentation nutrient. And then another critical step is slowly bringing that slurry back down to temperature, temperature and equilibrating it with what you're about to pitch into. And I would recommend that you first go like a one-to-one -one mixture of your yeast to your cider, let that have a half an hour, maybe even do that again, and then add that to your product. By and large, if you get everything going right and then you keep oxygen away and you keep things sanitized, you should never have problems. Now, I can say definitively, you will have problems. If you talk to anyone who's a commercial producer at any scale, they will tell you stories, at least if they're honest with you and themselves, about things that have gone horribly wrong. And that's just part of the nature of this. It's part of the magic of it too, that no matter how experienced you are, no matter how much money you've poured into your manufacturing facility, no matter what you do, you're going to have some surprises. What we need to try to do is minimize those surprises. And some of those can come from microbial problems. So Brettanomyces is a yeast that can cause some off flavors. It's also sometimes used uh, to build character is more um, popular now and you know even some Brett fermented beers that tend to be funkier but you know it all depends on what sort of flavors you're trying to create. Lots and lots of other microbes that can cause weird flavors that we'll discuss. Oxidation, we've talked about a bit, and I'll, I'll touch on this, but you know, it's a fairly simple idea that as long as you re prohibit oxygen ingress, you shouldn't have oxygen problems. Um, reduced sulfur aromas tend to come either from ferments where the yeast weren't happy, and by not happy, I mean if there's too much osmotic stress, if they're trying to ferment to too high an alcohol and by too high, probably over 13, 14%. So normally you shouldn't run into this with cider or they have nutritional problems or a number of other things can cause them to off gas hydrogen sulfide as a stress response. And that's the most likely place for you to get reduced sulfur aromas and Though if you do things like keep them on the lees for too long, you can also have issues. And then there are various taints. So things that can be picked up from additives or other things during manufacturing that can have really horrible impacts on the final flavor. Cork is potentially a area of off flavor and with packaging of cider moving more towards can or crown tops versus using say champagne style corks, 
you're less likely to have cork taint from cork. However, this musty smell that is incredibly persistent and also you can actually perceive at an unbelievably low level so at sub part per trillion levels you can smell this compound that makes everything just sort of smell musty you if you haven't specifically smelled a cork tainted bottle just think of what like a basement or a cellar that has some moisture in it and it is exactly that smell and because it has such a low odor threshold it can overwhelm a product quite easily now what's annoying about it is especially early on most of cork taint was ascribed to cork so there was lots of bad corks being produced and sold especially during the 1970s with some problems that were happening in portugal that is the major cork producer so a lot of wines using those corks ended up having this musty character we learned where this came from proper controls were put into place and yet you'll still run into cork taint you'll even run into cork taint when no cork had anything to do with it with the packaging or processing and the reason for this is that you really just need three things to create what is cork, cork taint which is this chloroanisol you don't there's not going to be a uh, written part of an exam on this so don't feel like you need to memorize this but basically if you have any phenolic compound so if you have a phenol which are the bitter and astringent component of cider as well as a component of oak barrels as well as any place that you're encountering wood there's going to be free phenols and you have chlorination so either somebody's used it for say in cork chlorine bleach was used commonly to whiten otherwise like dark or miscolored cork or if you're using chlorine as a sanitizer you've already gone half of the way there and the other step in this process is some sort of microbial growth including a healthy fermentation so we basically have no capacity to stop the step the second step you will have microbes around because that's the name of the game in cider production what you can control is absolutely omitting <clears throat> chlorination from anything that has any chance of becoming in contact with your product some producers go as far as to just wholly keep any chlorinated product out of their um, production facility just to ensure that no accident that you don't have an intern to think that they're doing something good and grabs the bleach container and pours it in a tank others still might use it for things like you know sanitizing the drains and as long as there's no chance of even the fumes coming in contact with your product or product lines you're probably all right but I would say there's lots of other options that we're going to discuss as far as sanitizing agents that you can pretty well steer clear of chlorine and then also avoid cork taint as a problem volatile acidity is made up of acetic acid and ethyl acetate and is generally what is used for measuring this component of production because you can directly measure volatile acidity through a fairly simple distillation product process and those of you who are interested in doing this yourself it's called a cash still c-a-s-c-h um, and you can measure it 
reasonably easy in your own production facility. It's critical because if you get too high with your total volatile acidity or both the acetic acid and ethyl acetate, you start to take on in the form of acetic acid, a vinegary smell in the terms of ethyl acetate, more of a nail polishy, nail polish remover smell. And the total or the volatile acidity can accumulate throughout your entire process. So everything from the fruit having some rot as you bring it in can start to contribute to the acetic acid level to even a healthy fermentation. You're going to get some amount of acetic acid produced as part of normal metabolism. And then this can increase further if you have some oxygen ingress and you have acetic acid bacteria actually growing. Same thing with lactic acid bacteria, which we're going to discuss. And then things like if you have really, really high gravity must, which normally isn't the case with cider, but still can occur in certain products, you start to drive up the acetic acid. And so each one of these is an ad addition that one in itself may not cause a problem, but thinking of your entire production process holistically can end up um, helping you to control and make sure that you don't have an issue with final um, volatile acidity. Another this critical element of this is that it actually is a um, controlled element of your product because if you go too high on volatile acidity, you no longer meet the definition of cider, which cider by some TTB things falls under still wine categories. And if you get over 0.6 or 0.8, depending on the some specifics about it, you technically no longer have cider. You have a cider vinegar product that you couldn't label as cider. Um, and additionally, one of the complexities is even if you have um, cider below the level of you know the threshold where you can smell it you have a chemical equilibrium between ethyl alcohol or alcohol the normal alcohol that's in cider and acetic acid and this produces ethyl acetate and ethyl acetate the nail polish remover smell can start to appear even after bottling so you can think everything's fine that your acetic acid level wasn't so high that you smell it, you bottle and then you open it up a couple weeks later and now it smells like nail polish remover. So as one of your final things before bottling, especially if you have any worry about your fermentation or that there was microbial problems or that the fruit maybe wasn't the best, I would advise that you measure your volatile acidity so you can ensure that you don't have any surprises later on in your production. Other than yeast, which you know can include our friend Saccharomyces cerevisiae or Brettanomyces, lactic acid bacteria are probably one of the most prevalent and important considerations in cider quality. In winemaking, Lactic acid bacteria can even sometimes be used to serve the purpose of digesting malic acid into lactic acid, which is a slightly less um, intense acid. Problem with cider and an apple product is unlike wine where there's also tartaric acid, which is undigestible, we only have malic acid. And so even the desirable strains of lactic bacteria that are used in winemaking would completely change your product, making it flabby and not having the acidic backbone and creating a lot of diacetyl, which is the smell of 
like microwave popcorn. So in cider making, it's more typical than not that all you're looking at is lactic acid bacteria is a bad thing. And luckily, it can be kept at bay pretty easily as long as you keep your sulfur dioxide above the appropriate level at a given pH. This is probably one of the biggest reasons why you may want to acidify your cider, even if you're happy with the flavor, if you're starting to creep up above pH 3.8, 3.9, especially over pH 4, it's very hard to add enough sulfur dioxide to inhibit spoilage bacteria growth. And these spoilage bacteria can contribute to volatile, volatile acidity, which we just discussed. Also, mousiness, which is a sort of smell of mouse urine, geranium taint. Um, and this is created by sorbic acid is frequently used as a preservative and lactic acid can actually digest this and make a geranium-like aroma. Um, as well as other things that are much less common, but I would say what I've seen the most in cider is you can have ropiness, and so this is just like you look at it and it sort of looks, I mean, it just looks sludgy and disgusting. And in part, if you think of what like a vinegar mother or kombucha mother looks like, you can even get in the bottle something that looks this just vile and really not appetizing for a cider product. I've also run into more mousiness in ciders than I ever have in any other product. I don't know whether that's a reason um, of the nature of high pH of ciders or there's something else, but it's definitely something that can be a problem in ciders. You can have lactic acid bacteria spoilage before fermentation. So you can even like all of acetic acid production and any number of things. Once you start to have not intact fruit, it isn't just always a matter of aesthetics. You then are having microbial changes that can add flavors that you may not even really realize are there until you have the finished product. So it can also happen during stuck fermentations, anytime especially you have sugar around and you don't have the yeast actively fermenting, something else will take advantage of that remaining sugar and it may not be a microbe that you want. And then finally, if you have low SO2, which can come from poor SO2 maintenance, or even if you're doing something like aging in barrel, you're constantly losing whatever SO2 protection you have, and you need to go back every week or two and check that the SO2 is being maintained in every single um, barrel, otherwise you can start to have problems and it can start to happen very, very quickly. So as I mentioned, and I'm not going to go into too much depth with this, but mousiness is a nitrogen containing compound that's produced by lack, certain strains of lactic acid bacteria and is incredibly, incredibly um, potent. So again, we're talking about something that most aroma compounds are in the part per million or part per billion range, which is still incredibly low. Unfortunately, things like cork taint and mouse, mousiness, we can perceive at part per trillion levels. So just a tiny little bit, a tiny little bit of infection is enough to ruin a product. And one of the critical elements of this that I think makes it particularly disgusting is that you can't normally perceive it by sniffing. So in 
flavor work, we refer to orthonasal and retronasal um, smelling. And basically this means if you swirl wine and just sniff it, that would be orthonasal. If you sip on a glass of cider, you still are smelling and you're smelling because you're a your olfactory epithelium, this thing that sits at the back of your nose, is also at the top of your throat. And so even with your nose plugged or having a, you know, a terrible sinus affection, you'd still be able to smell because it's bursting up and going up your throat. Why this matters here is that your only going to smell this mousy, this mouse urine character after you've actually swallowed it. So you then have essentially a mouthful of something that's horribly disgusting. And I can say nothing is going to hurt your brand more than consumers having the experience that you're serving them, you know, mouse urine. So being vigilant at SO2 maintenance, if only for this reason, is very important. Another potentially common problem that especially becomes an issue when you're dealing with things that have residual sugar. So let's imagine you create a product and then back sweeten with either fresh cider or cherries or any number of things. So you've got a whole bunch of sugar still remaining in that product. One way of dealing with that is sterile filtering and then keeping everything absolutely sterile through into the bottle. That is easier said than done. And if you don't manage that, you're going to have re-fermentation in the bottle and things will start exploding. and. Um, as far as things that get the TTB and your local liquor authority after you fairly quickly is exploding bottles. So the alternative that is especially a good option for smaller producers or home producers is to use sorbic acid. And sorbic acid is really nice because it's generally regarded as safe so it has grass status so you can just use it as a preservative and it will completely inhibit yeast from fermenting it however has absolutely no effect on lactic acid bacteria and so if you have sorbic acid without adequate so2 production protection you can actually have the sorbic acid being broken down and creating this incredibly potent geranium smell, which while geraniums might be a nice, you know, smell of summer there, again, it doesn't work well with the character that you're trying to pull off in cider. So the point of management of this is really, if you're going to use sorbic acid, you have to be extra, extra vigilant with your SO2 management and probably lowering that pH even a little bit farther than you would have otherwise because you can have a double whammy of bad smells and these bacteria also, if there's a large sugar source, even if the yeast aren't digesting that sugar, they will actually actively digest it. And again, you can have problems with exploding bottles and all sorts of other things. On the topic of sorbic acid, there's another element that it can apply to flavor. And this isn't always a bad thing, but Sorbic acid in the form in pr the presence of ethanol. So anytime we have a fermented beverage, we're going to have a bit of this being created is that it will completely abiotically just chemically form ethyl sorbate. And this the smell of ethyl sorbate is it's actually the flavoring agent of a number of hard candies and it isn't wholly unpleasant, but it's not always the aroma that you're looking for. 
So again, just in product development and considering what, how things may change from when you initially create something until it gets to the consumer, if you're going to be keeping a product with residual sugar in the bottle and using sorbic acid as a preservative, before you make a thousand gallons of something, make sure that the sorbic acid actually gives you um, the aroma and the quality that you want out of that product before upscaling. One of the other just absolutely critical elements to making sure that your cider and your firm is what it is and your fermentations go as planned is sanitation. That while this is a pretty simple compound, uh, concept, you have to remember that cider making is a pretty dirty process that at some point we go from this like almost um, surgery room cleanliness to just throwing in tons and tons of dirty fruit. And no matter how you try and control where that goes, you end up finding little pieces going everywhere. And so cleanliness and sanitation becomes really the major thing you have a handle on to ensure that you have um, consistent quality and also consistent quality year after year. I've known a number of different producers that they have a season or two that they make great clean products. And then some of those weird smells that we discussed that come from other microbes start to enter in. And this is because they started to get increased populations of some of these spoilage microbes or biofilms or a number of things that then persisted and made it hard. And it, then it's really, really hard to beat it back. So there's a few fundamental components of sanitation and modes of sanitation. So mechanical action, chemical action, which can also include a subclass that's physiochemical action. So this is sort of a physical chemical element of cleaning, temperature and time. And one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about all of this is that we're not just trying to clean what say, you know, if you Oh, I don't know, like dump some cider on the floor. That's pretty easy to imagine. You know, hot water is going to more or less rinse that off, right? Whereas if you look at a coffee cup that you've been using for 20 years, you've now have this stain that's like ingrained in there and trying to get that removed is a whole nother element. While that staining is more of a chemical staining, the microbial world has sort of its equivalent and its equivalent at pr preservation that after they start to just grow on the surface some microbes are very good at creating colonies that have biofilms and those biofilms can be very very hard so incredibly hard to remove and on top of it they can protect it from different sanitizing agents and temperatures. And once you have a strong biofilm formed, your normal sanitation processes might not work. And this is one of the reasons why a year or two into production in a new facility, you may start seeing problems that you hadn't before because before you didn't have these persistent biofilms and now you do. And removing a biofilm from say the inside of a tank where you can get in and scrub and really have that mechanical action is, I won't say easy, but feasible. Removing it from the inner workings of a pump or hoses that you're using or any number of valves and things that are really hard to take apart and especially take apart and really scrub, 
you're better off trying to preemptively keep sanitation problems than thinking that you can clean it up after the fact. And so mechanical action is, you know, something probably we all take for granted, but it's also something that is really critical to think about as part of a process so that first off, we're physically removing matter, you know, just even taking your hands and pushing things away and pushing the leaves out of the bottom of the tank or shoveling or scraping or mopping or any number of things are mechanical actions that are part of a broader system. You may need to integrate mechanical action into every one of your steps because it's not just enough to remove the gross matter first or scrub it first. You may need to scrub again when you're dealing with sanitizing agents or other steps in the process and just thinking of how you can best do this and also having the proper tools for the proper step. It's normal now as part of um, a HACCP safety plan that you may have special brushes and shovels for different steps in your process. And this is to help ensure that you don't have contamination from that gross initial apple matter with coming in contact later in your processing. Um, so just something to keep aware of and keeping, um, I would say, methodical in your process don't just think of a scrubbing brush as a scrubbing brush, but part of a tool as broad, of broader sanitation. There are lots and lots of different chemical sanitizers, some of which are not compatible with certain types of materials, some of which are may actually neutralize each other. So some are acidic, some are basic. Um, some have strong antimicrobial activity. Some are more solvents. Um, what you're using, again, there's a lot of different ways that people are very effective at having sanitation, um, but is to think methodically about what is going to work at what step of your process. Basic cleaners, including caustic soda, uh, there's been a few different recent um, studies that while these tend to be more dangerous, and you should definitely be aware if you're using something like caustic soda, you know, it can start to dissolve your skin just as well as it can break down lipids and biofilms but they're among the most effective for also even killing microbes. And so I personally think that they're a great thing into integrating at least at some point into your sanitation, but also using things such as acid-based cleaners or ethanol or acid and SO2 can also work very well. I'm going to really just quickly go through these so you get a rough idea of some of the dosage rates. I pulled this off from a UC Davis site on winemaking. And you'll see, you know, for the most part, we're not talking about giant amounts of any of these compounds. You see, you start to get into some of the proprietary blends, uh, <laughs> proprietary blends, um, like the non caustic soda basic cleaners or things like Star Sand, the price can go up. Uh, but I would say budgeting appropriately for your sanitation is always, you know, it is something that you just should be planning for. Just like using controls in the orchard is necessary to make sure you have clean fruit. Planning to spend some money on your sanitation chemistry and brushes and everything also is really, really important. All right. And so just another step, you'll see there's even in this a few chlorinated cleaners, which I just want to highlight again. 
chlorinated cleaners and any chance of contact with your actual product is a bad idea. And then ozone is a really nice, but again, many of these potentially, you know, have some danger. So be aware before you start using them, how they should be used and what sort of ventilation. But ozone is created just through radical formation, essentially running an electrical charge through water. And so you can buy ozone generators that either create ozone that's volatile, and that tends to be much more dangerous, or creating dissolved ozone that you can use essentially a hose and water to have very, very effective sanitation. And I think this is, as these units have come down in price and also down in scale, it's become more and more of a great thing to use in any sort of production facility. Uh, very briefly, physiochemical elements are, in a way, if any of you are already growing fruit, you're sort of familiar with things like surfactants. And so just like surfactants can help to get pesticides properly um, dispersed within a tank and then nicely and easily over a leaf or fruit out in the field, they also do a nice job pulling things up. And so it's really hard, right, to make, mix something oily with water. And so some of the things that we may be dealing with are lipids and these surfactants can help actually draw and keep in solution either the stuff that we're trying to clean out of a tank or a hose, or also are sometimes needed to help disperse the sanitizing agents that we're using. And I won't go through all of these, but you know, basically, you know, as I said, helping with wetting, deflocculation, which is sort of breaking things up, suspension. So, if you're trying to get a lot of something out of a tank or out of a hose, you want to make sure it's not instantly falling back down, helping to dissolve or create stable emulsions, or also to actually neutralize elements that may otherwise inhibit um, sanitation uh, modes of action. So if you've got a lot of alkali soil particles and you're trying to use a acid-based sanitizer, you may need to use something that helps to neutralize that alkali to make sure that your acid stays active. Another really important element of sanitation and sanitation or and sterilization is temperature. And frequently in parts of the process that you actually need to get to sterilization. And you'll notice that I've talked a lot about sanitation and very little about sterilization. And that's because sterilization is the complete removal and killing of anything that could be growing. And until you're actually hitting the point of bottling, we in the fermented beverage industry r rarely care about sterilization. It's all just about keeping everything controlled and sort of riding the wave of microbial growth and making sure everything that happens the way we want it to. But high temperature and high temperature for long time can take you through killing lots of things to killing everything in creating effective sterilization. And that's why high temperature steam is frequently used as one of the elements of sterilization for a bottling line. And so as I got into that, generally we don't need sterility. And part of the reason is that it's both not practical and um, yeah. So 
As a fundamental overview of the elements here, clean everything before you use it, clean everything after you use it, clean the premises, and then watch for anything that you might see growing anywhere around your production facility and make sure to absolutely stamp it out as soon as possible. This means if you see something weird growing on the top of your tank, you know, take an active interest in making sure that you've controlled it before you forget and allow that to establish. Now, very briefly, I'm going to touch on a few final things that could be a presentation in and of themselves, but at least want you to be aware of them as considerations and potentially things that you can read up on more elsewhere. So one of them is filtration, and there's a number of different reasons why you might want to implement filtration. Simply clarifying at a different step, um, helping with recovery. So one of the things that you saw in the slides last time is that after fermentation, you're going to have these gross lees at the bottom. And as you get up and up in fermentation or, or in production size, that, you know, five to 10% starts to be a pretty sizable amount of waste that you're just throwing out. And so larger facilities will actually have lees filters to recover every bit of product that they can and then just have hard packed you know yeast that can be used elsewhere you know potentially put on the field or fed to um, animals or any number of things also it can be used to stop fermentation so if you want to have a sweet product at the end this is one of the ways in which you can do it and then commonly a sterilizing filter is used at the end before bottling and can also be used to just sort of polish the flavor and make sure it visually has that brilliance that you might be looking for. They come in all sorts of different sizes, both size of the filter down to also size of the particles that you're actually filtering out. And there's lots of different um, styles of filter and it depends on what amount you're trying to do as well as what your final um, well what final product you're trying to create out of this how you're going to use filters and what sort of ones you use um, this can be a very expensive part of the process but it also in smaller scale production, you can get away with things that are very similar to what you would use for say, inline um, home water filters. They're just designed to be used in beer and wine and cider and get really nice results. Another consideration is if you're trying to make a carbonated product, how do you do that? And one of the classic ways of doing this that I mentioned earlier in this is through a secondary fermentation. So there are calculators for figuring out if you add a given amount of sugar into a bottle, so something like a champagne bottle or a beer bottle that can handle pressure and allow the yeast to re-ferment again, you can produce bubbles and then that product in bottle will be carbonated. It also will then have the yeast in there and it's a whole other complicated process if you want to create something like champagne that's clear and get that yeast out of there, but it is possible. The other ways about it is to actually force carbonate and this is a factor of pressure and temperature and a number of considerations. And while it can be faster, it also can be much more expensive from an equipment standpoint and potentially dangerous. So what makes sense for your production um, is really up to you. I would say starting out if you want a non-sweet bubbly product Carbonating in bottle probably makes the most sense. And why I specifically say non-sweet is if you are also expecting there to be sweetness at the end, the yeast will just keep digesting that sugar until the point that it actually explodes.
And so on that end, if you want there to be residual sugar, you can either plan on trying to have that product being absolutely sterile when both before and after adding whatever sugar or sweetening product or fruit flavoring, or you can use something like sorbic acid, which we've discussed some of the pitfalls of that, but it's definitely a great option, especially for the small producer, or integrating something like pasteurization, which again can be a great tool, but generally you have to go pretty large in scale before this really becomes an option. And then as a the last parting element that I just want to put in front of you, give you an idea of this SO2 equilibrium that I discussed earlier, is that at any given pH, you have a different amount of SO2 that is active. And anything over 10 part per million in the US needs to actually be labeled as containing SO2. And to give you an idea of what sort of amount of total SO2 you need to add to have an effective amount to control, this slide sort of goes over it. And I would say for cider, you're generally looking for about 0.8 part per million, so this middle row. And so you see at 3.5, you only need about 41. Whereas if you go up to four, it's now a whopping 128 parts per million, which you'll also start to smell. And so it's when you start getting this really high pH, it's going to be critical to do something to bring that pH back down if you want your sulfur dioxide to help stave off unwanted microbial growth. Well, thank you all. And with that, if you have any further questions, always feel free to contact me. Um, you can find my current contact information on the web, I'm sure, by searching for um, Dr. Misha Kwasniewski. Thank you.